Welcome to an introduction to economics, brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. This short podcast gives an introduction to some ideas relating to wages. The demand for any factor of production is a derived demand. In the case of labour, it is the demand for a good or a service. The demand for hot dog vendors at a baseball game is a demand derived from the consumer demand for hot dogs. We shall treat labour as a variable factor of production, assuming other factors are fixed, ceteris paribus. In earlier podcasts we met the idea of marginal revenue and marginal costs. A firm will maximise profits by producing until the last unit produced adds as much to the revenue as it does to costs. At this point, marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, MR equals MC. We are treating labour as a variable factor of production. The marginal revenue product, MRP, of a variable factor is the change in total revenue resulting from the employment of one more or one less unit of the variable factor. It will be equal to the marginal physical product multiplied by the marginal revenue. MRP equals MPP times MR. The value of the marginal product, VMP, of a variable factor is the market value of the marginal physical product of the variable factor. It is equal to the marginal physical product multiplied by the price of the final product, P. VMP equals MPP times P. The marginal factor cost, MFC, is the change in total cost resulting from the employment of one more or one less unit of the variable factor. If the market is perfectly competitive, then we know P equals MR. So if MRP equals MPP times MR and VMP equals MPP times P, then it follows that MRP equals VMP. Or put simply, A profit-maximizing firm will hire additional units of its variable factor of production up to the point at which marginal revenue product, MRP, is equal to the manufacturing cost, MFC. We now know that the equilibrium position for a profit-maximizing firm, marginal revenue product equals marginal factor cost. MRP equals MFC. The marginal revenue product, MRP curve, is shown for a firm in a perfectly competitive market, with a perfectly elastic supply for labour, S1, S1. The market wage is shown by OW1, where the MRP curve intersects the supply curve. Now assume the supply curve falls to S2, S2. The wage will form to fall to OW2. The result is an increase in labour employed, rising from OL1 to OL2. The map here shows the marginal revenue product MRP curve for a perfectly competitive firm and the average revenue product ARP. The MRP curve cuts the ARP curve at its maximum point. At OW1 the firm hires L1 units of labour. The average revenue product ARP will be L1B. The firm has a monetary surplus equal to BD which can be used to meet other costs of production. The ARP and MRP intersect at A. The firm will not pay a wage above OW2 or the wage would exceed the average revenue product and the firm would not be able to cover its variable costs. Our first idea proposed Cetris Paribus which would have assumed that if a firm raised its output, the other firms would keep their output the same. In fact, each firm will respond, so a fall in wage rates causes all firms to employ more labour. Total production will increase and price should fall. If price falls, the MRP will shift towards the origin. On the map shown, initially the wage rate is OW1, And if it falls to OW2, then the firm hires additional labour to reach L2, where it meets the MRP1 curve again. However, with all firms doing the same, the MRP curve will shift to MRP2. 
so the firm will respond by actually only hiring L3 units of labour. There are a number of limitations to the theory. Some workers will be more skilled or have specialist skill sets. So the labour cannot be regarded as homogeneous. The available supply will depend upon the skills required. It also assumes the maximisation of profit, which may not apply to a public corporation. Since many firms will offer a productivity bonus, the wage rate may change as productivity is increased in response to the promise of higher take-home pay. The total supply of labour depends on population but it also depends on school and college leaving rates and the retirement age. Changes in these affect the size of the workforce. Raising retirement age will increase the size of the workforce. Changes in the length of the working week and levels of unemployment benefit can also influence the size of the workforce. Other factors can also play a part. If wage rates rise in one area, then there may be new, new entrance to the workforce. A rise in rates for food retailing can attract married women and students to the workforce. Workers may also have a different perception from employers and prefer one job to another even if the wage rates are the same. In the past there were union agreements that prevented some workers from entering employment in some firms and professional bodies are still allowed to restrict the workforce. It can be argued that restrictions from the British Medical Association are a necessary part of control for health and safety. With whole areas of industry being closed, as in the case of steel production and coal mining, it proved difficult for many workers to relocate since the costs of moving were high. Costs included those of moving home, but also social costs such as children having to change schools. The map shows a series of indifference curves for a worker in choosing between work and pay. On this basis, the wage is seen as good to the individual and the work as bad. Indifference curves join all points where the combination of work and pay yield maximum utility to the worker. Indifference curves slope from left to right. The higher the curve, the greater the utility derived. The slope of OR1 is represented by AH1 divided by OH1. Now we plot the supply of labour against different wage rates. In simple terms, as the wage rises from R1 to R2, the worker is prepared to work longer and earn more. However, beyond the rate of R2, the worker prefers leisure time to working for more money. This is called a backward bending supply curve. The map shows a demand for labour from a monopoly. For an elastic supply curve, WW, the monopoly will employ labour up to the point where marginal revenue product is equal to E. So wages OW and labour OL. Any employment beyond OL would mean wages increased by more than any increase in total revenue, so profit would be reduced. The Pareto efficient point is where VMP, variable marginal product, intersects WW at E1, which means OL1 units of labour could be employed if there were perfect competition in all markets. The monopolist thus employs a smaller labour force than a perfect competitor. The term monopsimist is used where there is only one buyer of labour in a particular market. L units of labour will be employed where the marginal cost cuts the marginal revenue product and also the VMP line. The wage rate being W. In a perfectly competitive case, the intersection of SS with the marginal revenue product would allow L1 units of labour at the higher rate of W1. Both the supply of labour and the wage rate are influenced by trade unions, though the influence has declined over the last two decades. A trade union has a number of objectives, the most significant being the operation of a closed shop to restrict supply of labour. Other aims include full employment, higher wages and better working conditions. A closed shop agreement meant that a firm would only employ workers who are fully paid up members of particular unions. How does this affect wages? The trade union activity restricts the demand for labour and so the supply curve is shifted from SS to S1 S1. This increases the wage for, to W1 from W. 
and it reduces the quantity of labour employed from L to L1. There is a level of compromise. If the need to keep all members employed meant that L was the desired level, then the wage settlement would need to be at W. The problem with this system was that at a time of high unemployment, when some unemployed might settle for a wage below W, the union agreement prevented this. A minimum wage has been part of the economy in the United Kingdom and in the United States for some years. Opponents were inclined to argue that if the equilibrium point were E at, a, at wage W, representing the equilibrium between supply and demand, then pushing wages up to a minimum rate of W1 would only serve to raise prices. This, it was argued, would lead to high inflation and high unemployment. Others argued that higher wages meant more spending power and greater productivity. A minimum wage has been in operation for some years and there is no real evidence to link it to high unemployment. The map shows the hypothetical position where there is equilibrium in the market with L1 units of labour employed at a wage rate of W1. However, if only L2 units are employed there is disequilibrium, or if the wage rate is W2. Trade unions may resist cuts in wages that would help employ an excess su supply of labour. We have mentioned other factors, including the fact that labour is not homogeneous, it is not always mobile, and there are also some firms that promote internally rather than have open competition for positions. Other factors that should be considered are the cost of recruitment, advertising and interviews and so forth. To those seeking work there is a cost of going to interviews and the time and money lost the longer the search takes. To those in employment there is the question of balancing other benefits including leisure time. The two major acts to prevent discrimination were the ones that determined that an employer could not offer two different rates for the same job and the one that determined that men and women were entitled to the same pay if they did the same job. In addition, an employer could not discriminate between men and women for a job. There is still some way to go to achieve the objectives. The proportion of women in the part-time workforce is far greater than 50%, and median earnings of women only around 70% of those of men. This ends our short podcast on wages brought to you by Parkbent Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your studies. For more information about Parkbent Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.